Hey, Mr. Clarky here for week 31. Uh, I have a few reviews for you, an update, and some questions. Let's hop right into this. The first one I will be reviewing is from Afka Films. This is Bat Pussy. Yeah, and this also comes with, what's the title on here? The other one, uh, Robot Love Slave. So it's uh, two movies in here. Yeah, Bat Pussy. Um, Afka has this thing going on where, like, most of the, I don't want to say most, but a lot of the movies uh, have a better story how they got made than they actually what they are. And that is the definition of bat pussy bat pussy is this pretty much this lost porn film it only had one uh print of it and nobody really knows where it came from that's the that's the uh, mystery of it uh in the commentary they discuss that nobody really knows where this came from they think it's from arkansas they think it was made just to to play in maybe a local theater by these people uh the plot or lack thereof one in bat pussy follows this couple um, just, you know, an average looking couple. They're not anybody, anybody would ever say is vastly attractive or super attractive. They're just, you know, middle-aged average people in bed talking about having sex more than actually having sex. And then they proceed to have oral sex. This is about 45 minutes of the movie, the 50 minute movie. And every once in a while it cuts back to five minute sequence, uh, about the rest of the five minute sequence is this, uh, this woman who is bat pussy, who, uh, you can't have sex in this town without her being involved or shoot a porno film without her being involved. There's, uh, some visual gags in that, but again, they're only though. It's like only about five minutes of the whole video for uh, video or the movie. I, I don't even want to really call the movie, but she gets there uh, with the couple and they have a weird menage a trois going on, which involves pretty much only oral sex. A lot of heated argument between the couple, a lot of really awkward, weird things. The guy says some really gross stuff uh, and they basically just throw at each other's throats. There's The guy never gets a hard on in the movie, so I don't know if there was planned sex and he just couldn't, you know, uh, fulfill his part of the bargain or if it was something that they just wanted to have it kind of be light and oral sex without any action penetration i don't know the movie has like three camera angles the whole time uh the at the end the, the angle on the bed changes once but besides that it's always stationary uh again there is no real reason to watch this unless you want some laughs or you're interested in why it was made it has to be regional it has to be low budget independent i don't know they don't know why would i know it's just super bizarre and uh very cringeworthy and uh just icky as hell the other movie on here uh loves robots or what is it robot love slaves is a little bit better um i noticed it has an actual plot although uh, it is patched together with a lot of narration uh but i was actually surprised to hear instrumental versions in here of hey jude and uh you're so beautiful uh, i don't know how they got away with that maybe it's just different enough that they're not going to get in trouble but that struck me as odd this follows a story of a uh, a man who wants his wife is a paraplegic um and he's lonely. He needs love. So he creates these love sex robots, these uh, these love robots, uh, to uh, do his bidding. And uh, he soon realizes his wife might not actually be disabled. And as an audience, you realize she is. She isn't. And she's uh, cheating on uh, her um, on her husband with this doctor. And they want to, you know, commit him to a nut house and take take all his money and whatnot. Uh, it's a ridiculous plot. At the end, it, it seems to fade out. Like dialogue cuts in and out. It's like, are they changing something here? Is the print damaged? I don't know. You don't know. We don't care. There's actually sex in this one, so that's a plus if you're looking for a porno film. Um, it's better uh, because the only thing I really enjoyed was the in instrumental stuff on there and the music. Uh, the people look better. Uh, it's really weird. Again, both of these movies run about 50 minutes. On the disc, there's a commentary for Bat Pussy, which I did enjoy. They seem to really like the movie. Um, mostly probably because it's an oddity, and they, when they, they popped it in, they were just like, oh my god, what is this? And that's exactly, I can't believe it exists. I don't know why it exists. That's all I can say about it. On the disc, there's a couple of features on here. One, uh, it, they're, they're kind of like, you know, these strange... Um, you know, uh, PSA like things about stealing that stores would show to somebody in the sixties or seventies. That's actually better than both movies. It's 20 minutes. I like seeing all the old stuff on the shelves and how they, uh, you know, are talking about how criminals and whatnot, how they steal stuff. And, uh, it's just really long and in depth, surprisingly. And there is a how to date and how to not date segment on here as well. That's funny. Uh, like I said, those things are fun, entertaining. Uh, there's not much to the movies, but they do try to provide, uh, some bonus material on here. Uh, I don't know. It's really up to you. If you really like this kind of stuff, I'd check it out. But uh, I can't see myself revisiting it like Sword in the Claw, which is their previous re uh, one of their other releases, which I actually really enjoyed. But that's Bat Pussy. 
attention. Due to the adult nature of this motion picture, the management of the theater has asked that we not reveal its more intimate scenes. Hey, won't you fuck me, huh? Won't you kiss my ass? If you do not understand what an adult motion picture is, or if you would be offended by frank and intimate scenes, then we urge you not to purchase a ticket to this motion picture. See my balls right there? Just suck my balls a little bit. Shit! However, if you, like many of our friends and customers, enjoy the very finest in adult motion pictures, the complete... Do it and quit talking mm. about it, you motherfucker. Unexpurgated. How does it feel? Terrible. Unedited. I know you like to suck dicks. Shit. Uncensored version of this movie will be coming soon to this theater. My secret twat tells me somebody's about to shoot a fucking movie in my holy Gotham City. Nobody's gonna get away fucking around on that pussy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the unsexiest thing that ever happened in front of a camera. Back to the Yeah, okay. Let me get one more in there, yeah. Oh, it's What in the goddamn fuck do you think's going on here? What is all that shit? God damn it, quit coming in my mouth. Shit. The next one here is one uh, movie by Vinegar Syndrome called Frightmare. Um, this one, I believe, was made in 1983 or 81. Uh, the, the dates are kind of up in the air. This uh, this movie has a great setup. Um, there's Not to be confused with the Pete Walker movie, Frightmare, either. But this movie has a great setup. It follows these uh, horror fans who are obsessed with this classic actor. This actor is more like a Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing type. Um, this actor has a mean streak. He's actually evil. And um, he ends up passing away. And the uh, horror fans decide, you know, let's take his body and uh, have a party with it. Kind of reminded me of children shouldn't play with dead things in that aspect, that they dig out the body and decide to party with it. Uh, these are the meanest horror fans I've seen. Usually horror fans, I don't, th I don't know any horror fans that would actually dig up a body and hang out with it. But hey... I guess I don't know everybody. Um, these kids, uh, they take them to the Horse Society building, which is a super nice building. No way that the Horse Society kids would have this super nice of a building. Great location, though. Uh, and the guy, um, the, the horror host, or the, the horror icon, comes back to life through uh, his wife trying to figure out who stole his body. They do this kind of weird seance, her and a fan, and he comes back to life, and he starts picking off the kids in slasher fashion. Definitely turns into a slasher film at points. People will notice some familiar faces, especially Jeffrey Combs, uh, very young here. Uh, it's got to be one of his first roles if not his first role and uh there's some elaborate death scenes in here some are fun including a great decapitation which involves a crow afterwards that's probably the best put together one uh the atmosphere is nice um and the whole setup is brilliant the idea that this old horror host is coming back killing people reminds you of a, like a vincent price movie and and uh you would feel that it would unfold more like a vincent price movie but it ends up turning into like uh, the second half as a slasher fair and it, it tends to wear out its welcome it drags on a little bit too long the characters aren't really pleasant or uh interesting enough to keep your attention although a lot of them are good looking enough to keep some people's attention for a little bit but that that can't hold the movie forever uh there's some like i said it's not it's not uh incompetently made it's well made uh it's well shot it's got a great location it's got a great setup uh it falls flat when it comes to the second half it has uh, a couple people from Ghoulies, the director and one of the stars in Ghoulies, the original Ghoulies, uh, the kind of uh, goofy guy with the blonde hair. I can't think of his name off the top of my head. Uh, and some other familiar faces. Uh, the release is great. The, the picture quality is top notch. Um, and uh, there's two commentaries on here. One from Hysteria Continues, the slasher guys. Uh, they're, they're pretty well educated in the slasher movie, and I enjoy their commentary. But the other commentary I like better. It has uh, the two, David Dakota and David Dayval, who did the commentary for Satan's Cheerleaders. Uh, these guys are experts. Uh, they're... Uh, they're kind of almost a little queenie at times on there, but they're really funny and they got a great back and forth. And David Duvall was actually on set for the movie. These guys were alive during this time and working during this time, so they know a lot of stories about uh, the lead actor in here who actually appeared in Fearless Vampire Killers. And they talk about his career and they talk about being on set. Well, David Duvall does. Talks about being on set and some of the things that happen. Uh, it's a really fun commentary. I loved it. Uh, I laughed a couple times. And uh, when they kind of get a little bitchy towards somebody or something, they kind of uh, make fun of each other for it. And there's a lot 
lot of good, there's a lot of, there's a great back and forth here. There's also an interview with the director of photography on here. He seems like an interesting guy. I believe he, I remember he talks about working with like, uh, knowing Dennis Hopper, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, he seems like a pretty wild guy and has some wild stories to tell. It's a nice release. Uh, they did what they could for it. It looks way better than I'm sure anything Troma ever put out. This was distributed by Troma years ago, but, uh, they didn't create them. They didn't make the movie, but it's an interesting, uh, horror movie. Uh, it's something that you pop in, you know, and, uh, if you've already seen it, you'll kind of have it half on. And I think it has enough interesting things going on, uh, that people will enjoy it. Um, unfortunately not a great supporting, uh, likable supporting characters, but it's got some decent death scenes and some deep, deep uh, nice atmosphere and uh, a nice setup. Boris Karloff, Bela Lugosi, Lon Chaney, Conrad Wright. All stars lived and died, but only one came back. But still his corpse. Hey, let's take the body back and show it to the girls. Conrad, I always wanted to be your bride. Where did you go? Into darkness, then into flames. Then I came back. You brought me back. If that's where you've been, then send them that stole your body there too. Send them into the flames. Burn them. We got uh, Private Property is the next one here with uh, War Notes. This is a very early War Notes. This is 1960. This is before Ride to High Country. This is before, you know, way, way, way before um, Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia or any of that stuff. Oates looks really young. This follows the story of uh, Corey, uh, is it Corey Allen, who was in a bunch of movies, became a director later on, and War Notes. They're these kind of drifters, uh, and they have this strange relationship. Uh, War Notes, you kind of sense, may have some, um, you know, some homosexual tendencies in here. And for 1960, that they did that and they uh, kind of poke at it is really crazy to me. These two end up hiding out in this abandoned house to spy on this woman that they're, they're attracted to and interested in and it's supposed to be Warren Oates' first his uh you know to break his to you know to get him to not be a virgin anymore so there's this weird aspect going on and there's a very weird relationship well Corey Allen is like the uh, smooth talking one he kind of invades his house in a way and gains her trust as a as a uh, you know, a gardener and, uh, the woman's husband isn't always there and he can't really satisfy her sexually. So there's a strange thing going on there. So she's kind of, uh, in a way lusting after the garden guy, but not really. It sets up this really strange, like triangle between these three characters where, uh, Warren Oates seems really shy and strange and Corey Allen seems demented and like a sociopath, especially one of the older styles. So to be asked, like a Charles Starkweather or Richard Speck, somebody like that. Um, but, but it's an interesting movie. It looks gorgeous. It's in black and white. And uh, it's well acted. The dialogue feels way more fresh than it, it, it from the 1960. It feels like it was one of those movies that's kind of breaking the mold and being completely different for the time. Um, and this is a non-typical Warren Oates role. I mean, he always is such a good actor. He has, a, he has very good uh, facial expressions. But here, it's a little bit different. Some of the dialogue in here kind of shocked me when uh, they're talking and he says, how come you never made it uh, to Warren Oates? Uh, Corey Allen says it. And he says, well, you know, it's just I was waiting for marriage. He's like, no, you're waiting 
waiting for a rich dad. He says, don't you ever say that to me. And it's just, I was like, oh my God, that right off the bat, that kind of stuff in this movie. But uh, it ends, you know, uh, tragically. Really good performances, goes by quick, never boring, but just just a nice tight little story about uh, these two criminals, and uh, it gets into all these characters' heads, and you know it paints these kind of pictures of them and shows a little bit under their layers. But uh, it, 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 at points, uh, both of the characters get pretty violent, and then, uh, Corey Allen's a kind of scary character, but. Enjoyed it. Uh, really well made movie. Uh, there's not there's not much on here for extras, if I recall. I believe there's just a one one interview or something like that. Yeah, the still photographer and uh, technical consultant Alex Singer. And I remember that being fairly interesting. They talk about the movie a little bit, but nothing that really stood out. And besides that, it's a new trailer. It's kind of a lost movie, and I I, I do think it's worth people's time to check out, especially if they like those actors. And it it definitely feels like a transitionary piece where it's like kind of being more progressive. The director would later go on to do other stuff like The Outer Limits and, you know, it doesn't necessarily feel like, you know, that that big of a twist, but it is interesting as hell. I enjoy it. Who talking come you never made it? I'm saving myself for when I get married. You're saving yourself for when you meet a rich daddy. You don't talk to me like that, Duke. <laughs> first meet your husband? Oh, in school. We were kids together. We went to some dances and fell in love. It's like a bath. Come on in. Oh, no, thanks. I get my hair wet. Well, I guess it's soon, huh? How do you know? How long does it take? You want me to go down there and drag her up here by the hair? You want me to hold her while she screams? You're gonna take it for yourself, aren't you? Nobody's gonna take nothing. The next one here is by Kino Lorber. This is River of Death uh, from the late 80s. I wanted to see this because the cast in here is amazing. Michael Dudikoff is the star. He's an action guy. Uh, I believe he was in, what's that one? Uh, Avenging Force, which is top notch with a great cast as well. A canon movie as this one is. Has Herbert Lom, who's amazing. Donald Pleasance, who's amazing. Uh, Robert Vaughn, who's great. And L.Q. Jones, who's also amazing. So it's got a, a very interesting cast, a very interesting plot, and it's by the director who did Drum. And that was kind of a mismatch too. It was like an exploitation like kind of slave thing this is definitely a mismatch too it is an action kind of jungle nazi adventure this is going to be a mouthful to explain the plot donald pleasance and robert vaughn are these evil nazis and one double crosses the other and escapes into the jungle the other one wants to hunt him down he acts as somebody else to get the trust of a, a guide group and michael du uh, michael dudikoff to lead him into the jungle and this ragtag team of people goes in herbert Lom plays this local police enforcer who uh is up to something, and LQ Jones is this pilot. So that sets it up. They end up going into the jungle where they have a meet a bunch of hostile tribes, and there's a lot of explosions and pirates and gunfights. Uh, it doesn't always work. You don't really care about many of the characters necessarily. The score, I think, could have been a little bit more dramatic. I think it would have pushed the movie a little bit further. But uh, saying that, it is fun. It is ridiculous, and the ending's great. And it, it's really nice to see these kind of actors interact, like Donald Pleasants and Robert Vaughn and LQ Jones. Herbert Lom's always top notch in it. And I love the twist with Herbert Lom. It's fairly solid action and it, it's gross. There's like viruses going on where people are just rotting. The Nazis are making like these crazy viruses. I imagine this is what it was like to get those like, uh, what are those like Ed Gein books that he used to read, uh, that they say warped his brain, like seeing like the, the, uh, head shrinkers in Haiti on the books and all these weird kind of Nazi experiments. This is probably like a pulp novel from the like forties, I guess you'll say. Uh, I imagine it's like that, but it's complete nonsense. And, uh, some of the wigs and mustaches on people just end up disappearing. At times it does feel like those like 70s uh, Italian jungle adventure movies. 
But uh, yeah, there's a commentary on here. That's pretty much it. Uh, it it's enjoyable. I like a lot of the ca actors in it, and it's nice seeing them interact. And uh, there's squibs. It is a canon movie. Uh, when you think canon, you think crazy, and you, you, you're thinking right, because that's pretty much what it is. But that's River of Death from the late 80s by, uh, I think the director's name is Steve Carver. Deep in the heart of the Amazon jungle lies a world of beauty and of fear. A place where great fortunes can still be found. We are talking about the lost city you may have found off the Rio de Morte, Mr. Hamilton. And great mysteries hidden. It's a myth, Hamilton. Forget it. I have maps that located. John Hamilton is a lone adventurer who has stumbled upon a terrible secret. You're really going back there, aren't you? Just give me what I need. Some want to buy him. He's prepared to pay $15,000. Not prepared to accept fifty. Some want to sell him out. Someone scammed us the troll! We're losing power! But he must return to find the truth. Let me warn you. Anything that you find belongs to the state. Oh, no! He's dead! Why are you so cold-blooded? Bergens is paying me, but you? It's not like Bergens is your type. What is my type? Tell them who you really are, what you really want. You won't stop us, Hamilton! This country is going to be ours! 20 years, no one has come for us. Now I am ready to strike. <laughs> Michael Dudikoff, Robert Vaughn, Donald Pleasance, and Herbert Lom in a film based on the best-selling thriller by the master of suspense, Alistair MacLean. River of Death. The next one here is The Ninth Configuration by uh, William Blatty. The, the writer of The Exorcist directed this movie. This movie's been on my radar for years. I had always uh, put it in my cart, took it out, put it in my cart, took it out. I was like, man, I just need to uh, buy this damn thing. And uh, eventually I did. Uh, the Ninth Configuration star... It, it, it's a strange plot. It... Um, has all these uh, Vietnam vets who are suffering mental illness uh, put into this kind of abandoned castle. Uh, and they're supposed to have, they, they think it's something strange with them. They're completely nuts. Uh, Stacy Keach comes in. He's supposed to be a new psychiatrist. But right off the bat, you know, nothing, something's not right with Stacy Keach in this movie. He seems stranger than some of the patients. Um, and right off the bat, you know, nothing's as it seems. And Stacy Keach comes into this weird place, and almost it feels like a Voltaire candy, Voltaire's candy, the story. It's absurd. It's, 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 Kind of like uh, ironic, but also like absurdist and crazy. Uh, the cast includes is an amazing cast. It includes a bunch of familiar faces. You got Scott Wilson in here, Jason Miller, Richard Lynch, Joe Spinell, Moses Gunn, Neville Brand. Who else is in here? There's probably some people I'm forgetting. Uh, William Blatty himself. But it's a tremendous cast. It's tremendously well acted. It's a movie that feels like one flew over the cuckoo's nest at times. But like I said, uh, it also has this spiritualism, this questioning of religion, which Blatty seemed to always kind of have in his stories, uh, like The Exorcist with the priest uh, questioning his own religion and things like that, what happens and whatnot. And uh, these two characters, uh, Stacey Keach and Scott Wilson, are arguing about religion. And there's these weird psychedelic moments, the flashes, and uh, hilarity, hilarious comedy, and just off the wall stuff. Stuff. And Robert Leosh is in it as well, and he is intense, as always. But I've never got to see him play a crazy guy. Neville Brand plays one of the commanding officers, and he's top-notch. And he's just upset and angry, and his voice is booming, uh, yelling at all these guys. Uh, and Tom Hankins is even in it. So, I mean, it, it's a tremendous movie. The first half, it feels like this kind of uh, dark, humorous, uh, ironic, uh, strange, and... Uh, movie but the second half completely takes a turn it gets really really dark these guys are vietnam vets and this twist is revealed and they give you hints at it but when it's revealed it'll 
it blows your mind. This is uh, this is an amazing performance by Stacey Keach. Stacey Keach is the guy I can never dislike, no matter what he's in, from Long Riders to Class of 1999 to the television show Titus to Body Bags. Stacey Keach is always so good. And this one is, is one of those movies where he really gets to show uh, a, a great performance. And uh, his intensity is there. Uh, there's a scene where he's being, uh, I don't want to give it, you're kind of rooting for him to come through without, and it's just a really intense scene. And it's so strange because the other parts of the movie, there are scenes that go on for a long time, but it seems like time progresses faster. But when this scene happens, it, it lasts a long time and it gets brutally violent. Uh, and at the end it is depressing, but it's also enlightening. And it just, it's a complex way to say some things. And it, it says them a lot different than anyone else would say them. Uh, there's a commentary on here, which was great to hear. And, uh, there's like 20 minutes of deleted scenes, which I love seeing. It's a nice release. It's a uh, very interesting, I guess there's several cuts of this movie. Uh, this one, uh, I believe runs close to two hours. Uh, an impressive movie. I think that anybody that's interested in, you know, like a uh, weird take on spiritualism and, uh, the Vietnam war and all sorts of things. It, it's a, gr it's shot in a great location. There's a strange narration. It, it's a beautiful movie. Uh, it's filled with tons of actors that, uh, give tremendous and absurd performances. I'd really recommend, uh, seeing it. It's, it's, a, it's a very unique movie. Tell your stupid agent never to waste any more of my time. First class. Can you imagine? Look at that. Here I am, casting Julius Caesar. And what do they send me? A dog that lisps. Spinel. Out. Take a hike. Your turn. Good manic. Out. Get out here. Get lost. Give me a reason. One good reason. Colonel, do me a favor, please. Explain to this moron here that in none of the plays of Shakespeare can there be a part for Superman. That could be the way I explained it. The way you explain Jesus. Do you know what he wants? You want to hear? When the conspirators draw their knives, he wants to rescue Julius Caesar. Ready? Swoop down like a rocket, pick him up, and then go hurdling mighty temples in one single incredible bound. Jesus, Mimic, are you crazy? Gentlemen, who put the flies in my paint pan? Bananas. Reps. Reps, please. Starlet, look at this. Did you bring any photographs on that? Jesus. Go talk to your brother. I think he has the falling sickness. Please. Will these people be staying for dinner? The cook is uh, fixing Mexican. He wants to know how many. I can't. Mr. Man just threw off. Better go check on him. <laughs> she bit me. I told her she was lousy. And she bit me. Maybe I'll use penguins. Don't you hear that, damn it? You can be replaced. The next one here is the Weekly Western. Let's go. Why not? Fill your hand, you son of a bitch! Say when. <laughs> Knock, 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 
Kitty, you bastard! It's you and I! <laughs> This is The Hired Hand by Arrow Academy. Yeah, this one was directed by Peter Fonda in 1971. It's actually his first movie he directed. And uh, he uh, did it with Warren Oates. Warren Oates is the star of this. Pretty much a three-person cast. Uh, and I, I can't think of the, the woman's name. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to cheat a little bit. But it is uh, Verna Bloom. Uh, tremendous cast in here. They all do a, a splendid job. This is a strange movie. This is a quiet Western. This is a slow-moving Western. This is a Western about relationships, but also it has some of those, uh, you know, themes that happen in a lot of Westerns, like your uh, past catching up to you, like, uh, you know... Uh, loyalty and things like that. War Oates and Peter Fonda are these, uh, and another guy are these. They, these three guys, the cowboys, or I guess drifters, essentially, and they're on their way to California. You don't really know much about them. They stop in this kind of crappy town, and something tragic happens. Uh, that sets the stage for them to get some revenge. Uh, after that, Peter Fonda realizes he wants he's tired of running. He wants to go back to his 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 home, his wife that he left seven years ago. And uh, War Notes decides to go with him. It, it's kind of a strange uh, situation there. He left the, his wife seven years ago, so he hasn't seen her forever. And when he gets back, there's a strange, shaky relationship with these three. Um, and he, and uh, soon Peter Fonda realizes that his wife, you know, has not really been faithful, but you can't really expect her to when you leave somebody seven years. It's complicated because there's a kid involved. And War Notes is complicating things as well because he's best friends with him and they've been traveling together for so long. Uh, and then uh, by the end of the movie, some, some things unfold, some people leave and come back. I don't want to spoil it, but you know, that, uh, that action that you do does catch up to you. And, uh, that's what happens. And, uh, some characters are, uh, made, uh, to make some decisions and, uh, it's going to end in a dramatic fashion. It's, it's well made. It's superbly well acted. It's not overacted at all. It's acted realistically. It feels real. When people leave, when people move, it, it all feels real. It's almost a lot of it's in real time. Uh, there's a lot of subtlety in the performances, and uh, I love that. Uh, there's weird montages, like these strange montage dissolves, which I've never seen in any other movie, not quite done like that. And uh, they're really unique. They look beautiful. And at first they're a little bit jarring, but as you get used to them, you realize that they're, they're, they're amazing. Uh, it also goes perfectly with the score. The score is uh, just inner, inner, uh, inner, uh, instrumental, and it's uh, beautiful. It was the first time this guy ever did a score for a movie, and uh, it's a tremendous score. It just fits so perfectly in the movie. Um, there's some weird kind of bizarre characters as well, but they're played uh, really Realistically, even if they are weird, uh, it's just a, it's a great movie. There's uh, some nice features on here as well. There's a commentary of Peter Fonda. He talks about working with the actors and uh, the actors and actresses in the film, and he's very complimentary. And uh, you know, he talks about Warren Oates, and that's always sad because Warren Oates died way before his time. He's only 53 years old. He died in like 83 at 53. I mean, he could have been alive for another 25 years or so. So uh, that's always sad to see that. Uh, there is a, a Q and A. It's only audio in London where Peter Fonda and Warren Oates talk to the crowd and they answer some questions. It's great because I don't I don't remember seeing. Two many Warren Oates interviews, if, if any, to be honest. So it's nice to see Warren Oates interact with, you know, fans and, you know, fan f uh, film fans and whatnot. And Peter Fonda, they seem to be enjoying themselves on stage. Uh, Peter Fonda doesn't really hold anything back when people ask him questions. And he, he's, he can be funny, although a tad bit smug, but it, it's entertaining. I like it. Uh, yeah, it, it's a nice release, like I said. Uh, there's deleted scenes on here as well, and they explain why they're deleted in uh, the commentary. And I, I agree, they, they seem to screw the flow up. But uh, it's got a great uh, end uh, fight scene without spoiling too much. And uh, it's, it's a quiet Western. It's uh, heartfelt. It's sad. And it feels real, man. Everything feels real about the movie. And uh, a beautiful score with some beautiful editing. Make it a, make it a real winner. <laughs> recognize this place until I saw that peak and I remembered ah! guess I decided then it's just a waste living like this Arch you gonna go with Harry you ain't gonna go to the coast where you gonna go then home how long is it gonna take you to ride back Week. 
thereabouts. How do you know there's anything for you there? I mean, once she's married. Haven't thought on it. You don't have any right to come back this way. You think I can't send you away, think you're still married to me, but that ain't so. I don't want Janie upset. As far as she knows, her father is dead. I don't want you saying no different. Look, Hannah, just let me work the place for a bit. Like a hired hand. I love you too, Hannah. Since she slept with the hired help. It wouldn't really matter whether it was you or him tonight. Is he dead? You shoot him. Harry, what are you doing? They cut off one of Arch's fingers. One each week, they say, till I get there. Arch is in this trouble because of me. I have to get him out of it. And when that's done, I'll be back. Give me a gun. I'll kill him. I'll kill him. Where's Harris? He's here. When you have to shoot, shoot, don't talk. Okay, guys, let's get into the Q&A. We have a, a question that I missed last time. Sorry, James Grimmer. What's your favorite Charles Bronson movie? Do you lean more towards his action movies or his westerns? Uh, my favorite Charles Bronson movie is The Dirty Dozen just because I grew up with it more. But do I prefer his westerns or his uh, action you know, I, I'm equal. I enjoy both of them. I actually like his war movies, too, like if you take in consideration like Dirty Dozen and Great Escape. So I'm not really sure which I prefer. We have Christopher Dallier. What is the weirdest film that you ever saw, have ever seen? That is so hard. I see so many weird movies. I can't, I can't really think of any just off the top of my head weird movies. What was that one? I see some strange things. The Oregonian, Oregonian is really bizarre. That's just right off the top of my head. That movie is insane. Uh, crazy, crazy movie. And those uh, movies by, um, uh, geez, I uh, can't think of Lucifer Valentine. Not that I'm recommending them, but those are super bizarre. Like, almost like I can't believe these are made. Uh, favorite Kung Fu B movie? Hmm. You know, I'm not super into the Kung Fu movies. Not that I dislike them. It's just not something I've delved into. But I'm going to go with uh, Seventh. Uh, uh, seven Golden Vampires, the Hammer one, where it's the Shaw Brothers meets Hammer, and it's the final uh, Hammer's Vampire movie, uh, well, Dracula movie. That one's really fun. Uh, Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires, that's it. No no Peter, Co uh, no Christopher Lee, but it's really fun, and it's awesome, and it reminds me of like Army of Darkness, a precursor to it. Uh, Carl Espinoza, what's your opinion regarding the new Halloween movie? We'll disregard the other movies after the first movie, especially after Halloween 2. Um We'll disregard the other movies after the first movie, especially Halloween 2. Uh, I don't really... I, I've been asked a lot about that, but I don't... If it looks good, I'm going to see it. I'm not... I'm not... I mean, I don't know where else they could go. I don't I don't know what else they're going to do. Uh, the timelines have gotten so confusing on a lot of these movies. I'm just surprised they let it happen. It's almost as confusing... It's going to be almost as confusing as this, this uh, X-Men timeline. Uh, do you have a favorite John Wayne movie? You know what? It's probably going to be The Searchers after watching that. It's got to be. Nick, uh, that was Matthew Lee Bushwell who asked that. Nick, loads of people uh, watch movies, uh, VOD, Netflix. I prefer DVD, Blu-ray. Many claim that Blu-ray and DVDs are on their way, are way too expensive and just for stops. What are your thoughts? Uh, my thoughts are that a lot of people are going to be coming back to DVDs and Blu-rays, I think. Um, uh, Netflix is out there, yes, but then there's other companies seeing that, like Warner Brothers and uh, Sony and Disney. They're going to start seeing that, and they're going to be like, you know what? Why don't we just make our streaming channel? And it's just going to be like cable over. You're going to get this package. It's going to be an internet package. And if net neutrality passes, you're going to get more of that. You're going to get, oh, well, now you got to pay for Netflix and YouTube and uh, all that stuff. So I can see that the physical copies might go up, may, might actually become a little bit more popular than they were because, you know, if the Internet's no longer uh, a free-for-all and, and then people start, you know, doing things with it where you're out of your control and you have to pay extra for services or your bandwidth limited on certain things or, you know, it might change things up. Also, like I said, a lot of these companies are, are going to want to do their own streaming services. It's already happening, you know. So I think that the DVD Blu-rays are going to go up in value. 
or go more people are going to want to see them. Any other specific time periods you enjoy exploring Viva the Silver Screen? Um, I like gothic core movies, so not, not necessarily a time period, but you know, I like big castles. I love the castle stuff. I, you know, like the old Hammer movies. I love anything in that time period, like old London and whatnot, and Times of Jack the Ripper. I like that kind of stuff. Uh, John Wilhelm, what is your favorite Steve McQueen movie? Going to have to be either The Getaway or The Great Escape. I grew up watching The Great Escape, love The Great Escape, really good stuff. So that's probably either The Getaway or The Great Escape. Let me get into the update. I have a decent amount here to show you. I'll hop right in. Uh, we have Hamburger Hill. This is, uh, I believe, the Canadian release, but it comes with DVD and Blu-ray. Pretty cheap. Haven't seen that in years. It's always like people are like, remember Platoon? Again, they start talking about it. They're like, remember Hamburger Hill? Yeah, I remember it. Like, no one talks about it. No one gets in-depth with it. But I remember seeing it. Uh, that's about all I can talk about it. And a lot of people getting shot. Uh, Rio Conchos, Take a Hard Ride, uh, Butch and Sundance, The Early Days, and The Last Hard Men. This is a four-pack Western. I wanted to check that out. It was a pretty good price. So that's four Westerns. What do we got here? We got Smash Cut. This is the David Hess-directed movie, R.I.P. Not seen it. I uh, picked up the Blu-ray. Uh, they were having Red Dawn on sale, which I thought was a shout select, which is cool. John Milius movie, great cast. Uh, Harry Dean Stanton, Ben Johnson are in it. That's why I kind of picked it up. And John Milius. Uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night. Uh, yeah, I picked this up from Scream. I did not get the action figure. I don't need all that stuff. Clawed. I have too much shit as it is. I don't need any to buy anything else like that. Uh, Riot. This was on sale. This is a William Castle production with Jim Brown and Gene Hackman prison movie from Olive Films. That's interesting. Uh, I picked up the, the prequel, I guess, not prequel, but the uh, first one of the, you know, kind of related to drum, Mandingo. It's got Perry King in it. Uh, what else do we got? And Susan George. God Told Me To from Blue Underground. Had the DVD, and it's one of the Cohen movies I didn't watch. I wanted to check it out on Blu-ray. Shockwaves, haven't seen this in years. Has Peter Cushing in it. Uh, Ken, Ken Wiederhorn, who did um, Return of the Dead Part 2 and Eyes of a Stranger, if I'm not mistaken. Did he do Eyes of a Stranger? I think he did, but... Uh, I know we did uh, Return of the Dead 2, which I really enjoy. Circle of Iron with David Carradine. And uh, Fast Company by David Cronenberg from Blue Underground. Oh, that's not it. I still got a little stack over here. So then we got Hang Em High with Clint Eastwood. Five bucks. The Gauntlet. I paid like six bucks for this. Clint Eastwood uh, with his wife at the time. What was her name? Sandra Locke. Uh, Dog Day Afternoon with Al Pacino. Again, I got a lot of these cheap, so I figured I'd grab them. Midnight Express. And a lot of these are classic movies I hadn't seen or I hadn't seen in years, so I grabbed them. But uh, I hope you guys liked that uh, video. hope you liked the Weekly Western. hope you guys liked everything I showed you. Uh, if you have any comments, concerns, or anything like that, uh, make sure you put them below. Ask a question if you like. I'm always here to answer them. Um, if I miss a question, I'll get it in the next video, so don't worry. Uh, also, if you want to see these, or hear them, I should say, in audio form, I went ahead and uh, kind of shortened a little bit of them and uh, put them in uh, pairs on the Shut Up Brandon podcast feed, which is also available on iTunes if you want to subscribe. You also hear the uh, um, Late Night Rentals with Brandon Salkill and his wife on there as well. But I just want to thank you uh, guys very much for watching, and, at o at and as always, have a good one.